Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. Hello, spooky soul, and welcome to episode 74 of Creepy Court and Folklore. I wanted to say it like that because it rhymes, but we're really getting up there. And I'm also having you know (laughs) that I am again fighting myself for not this episode, but the next one. It was um, it was kind of a thought process of mine that every 25th episode, like for the 75th and the 100th and stuff like that, assuming I get to that point. Um, cause Hey, what's 25 more episodes? <laughs> um, but I thought maybe those would be the special episodes, but looking at my workload and looking at what I'm able to do, that's just not possible. And so I need to chill out and just focus on having these little episodes that even when I say they're going to be shorter, haven't even been that much shorter. I'm also toying with the idea where in the new year, I might do an every other week type of thing. And that way, it's not every single week I'm recording. It might be every other week that I'm recording. And if I fall behind, it's easier to catch up, that kind of thing. The time frame that I'm recording right now, there is a lot of holiday gathering stuff going on. And even though my Bebo is about to turn two, it's the first time she's remembering everything. And so I'm trying to make sure that she has like a wonderful magical time uh, during November, December time frame. <laughs> um, and I hope that you are having a magical time during November, December time frame, because I know I've talked about this with you before, but I almost have that like, you know, at the end of a race where runners get that kick where they they like, wow, where did this last little bit of energy come from? And they they cross the finish line and then they collapse on the other side. I feel like that's what happens to me during the year. Like my stamina just decreases and decreases. Then randomly in October, I'm like, yes, this is everything. I have so much energy. I'm so creative. Oh my God. And then I just collapse November, December, which is very poor timing, I have to say. But I think I was meant to hibernate and my ancestors come from much warmer places. So we will see how this year goes. And maybe I'm just thinking this because it's the end of the year and things feel like crunch time and I'm still not where I want to be with my sequel. So I'm trying to give myself more buffer room. Um, And on top of that, you know, just like how I'm going through some stressors and, you know, there's been a family, extended family loss recently too. And lots of family stuff in general going on. Um, that that's also the case for a lot of the folks I work with. Um, and so things kind of ramp up during the holiday seasons as well, because there's a lot of people spending time with, you know, family members that they don't usually do or friends are in town that they haven't seen since college, like all sorts of things go on. I'm sure you can relate to this too. Not trying to make your holidays um, or non-holidays stressful, but just there's like a lot of pressure from all sides um, for people during, you know, late fall and winter time and a lot of like, what's the new year going to look like, that kind of stuff. So to tell you the truth, I'm feeling like a little bit squeezed and a little bit behind in all of my work, like in all facets of my life, whether it's being a parent or being an author or being a podcaster or being a therapist, I feel quite a bit behind with lots of things, even though I'm not actually behind. Um, so I just wanted to tell you that a little bit, not trying to be a Debbie Downer today, um, but just that I'm feeling a little bit pressured. So thank you for bearing with me when I kind of have these shorter ones or kind of talk out loud about like, maybe doing every other week starting in the new year or something. I don't know if that'll be the case, but I didn't want you to be surprised if that was the case. But anyway, I'm really excited for today's topic. Um, It all started because um, I loved this trend. I probably should try it if I have a moment because it looks like it's somewhat easy to put together. It's just kind of doing the opposite of what makeup tutorials tell you to do but it's called the uncanny valley makeup challenge or whatever 
Um, and it's so funny because my friend Alexandra, um, her handle on Instagram is gliding through life 15. Um, she was like, I had a visceral reaction to what you posted. Like, these are upsetting to me. And I was like, oh, nice. <laughs> That's exactly my intention. And I was like, maybe I should try the makeup challenge. She's like, no, I don't like that idea. Like, do what you want. But oh, my God, this is so upsetting for me to look at. But you should maybe if you have a chance. This is an idea for an episode. And I was like, oh, my God, Alexandra, you're right. So I am taking her advice. And um, hi, Alexandra from Creepy Corn Folklore. You're the best. Um, And she just had a great idea. So I started looking into it and she said something along the lines of like, oh, there must be like a reason why people feel like that way. Like I wouldn't have a big body reaction to this thing if it wasn't rooted in survival or something like that. So I was like, I think you're right too, but I was kind of rusty on the psychology of it all. So I looked some stuff up and it was very interesting. So let's dive headfirst into the uncanny valley. (laughs) So the uncanny valley, in case you're not aware, is a term that was coined by the Japanese robotic roboticist Mashiro Mori. And it's this like unsettling feeling that people have. Um, It ranges in severity. But when they're confronted with this object that kind of resembles a human, but is not quite right. And so it turns out that this phenomenon is deeply rooted in human psychology and has like implications for our interactions with robots and then AI and virtual characters, even cartoon characters, things like that. We're going to look at the uncanny valley and like why humans experience fear and discomfort um, and a whole range of other emotions in its presence. So what we found, I say we as if I'm part of a research team, I'm going to pretend I'm part of this research team, (laughs) Um, is that the more human-like in appearance that something is, the more we have an emotional response that's positive toward it until a certain point is the caveat to that. So when we see something that resembles a human but, but is not quite perfect, there's this huge decline in emotional response um, that creates that, quote, valley in this graph of comfort levels if we were to draw it out. Oh my gosh, side note, we have a visit from our squish-faced friend right now. Here's our boy Kachu to thank the Kachu Cuddlers for this episode. He is so happy right now. So thanks to both of you for being in the Kachu Cuddler tier. It really means a lot and it makes making episodes a lot of fun. And I'm, I heard about an idea from Athena recently um, that she was talking about, and I thought it was very fascinating. So that will be in a future episode for sure. But now dipping our toes into the psychology of it all. So this is someone I'm sure you've heard of that I have a lot of feelings about and opinions about, but we'll look at it as more of a philosophical concept. But of course, there's Sigmund Freud. Um, the Freudian roots here. Um, The uncanny or the unheimlich in German means unhomely. And it kind of provides a foundational understanding. Um, So he suggests that the uncanny is linked to repressed infantile complexes and the return of the familiar in an unfamiliar context. So basically faced with something eerily lifelike yet not quite human creates these deep-seated anxiety and unresolved emotions that may resurface. Shoving Freud to the side for a second, something that is actually studied. <laughs> I'm being so shady towards this, this man. He was um, a little bit of a piece of work, but whatever. So if you do, there's this infant study that was done by, let me look her up real quick. Okay, of course, this is way more convoluted than I thought. Okay, let me see. (laughs) This is how all the rabbit holes go, isn't it? All right, follow with me down this rabbit hole really quickly to understand what I'm about to say, because I always feel this pressure to give backstory behind what I'm about to talk about. Okay, in 1978, 
there was this thing called the strange situation procedure. It was done by Ainsworth, Blehar, Waters, and Wall. And those psychologists slash researchers put an infant in a room and had their parents leave and uh, how they acted when the parent left versus when the parent came back. I believe it was specifically the mom, which I have thoughts about, but whatever. When the parent comes back, how they react is telling of the type of attachment they have with that caregiver. Um, Attachment can span, this is me being a therapist for a second, attachment can span to all people, not just the parents. It can span to anybody who's being a caregiver or that is an adult protective figure or supposed to be an adult protective figure in that child's life. You can't help what kind of attachment style you have because of this, but also in therapy and trauma work, you can do attachment work to, you know, make sure that you have a healthy one with yourself and others. So the quote healthy one, this, if you don't have this attachment, I personally have, um, uh, this is like so personal. Oh my God. But I personally have a, um, anxious attachment style that I will crop up every once in a while if I am not aware of it. And I've been doing work to make sure I'm more in the secure realm, but the golden attachment is the secure attachment and the infants acted for each of these infants acted a certain way. And I was about to go into each way they reacted, but there's, I don't want to do that gives me more to edit. So you're getting bare bones. This is my version of bare bones. I know it's way more in depth than it should be already. (laughs) So there's secure attachment, avoidant attachment, anxious attachment, and then Maine and Solomon in 1986 and 1990 did research based in the University of California, Berkeley, where the first two, those were the first to propose a formal disorganized attachment. Um, And if you are curious about any of these things, I'm going to include this um, article in the show notes. But all of that just to say that during this study, oh my God, you know what I just realized is I'm not even talking about the right study. Well, attachment styles are good for you to learn. Forget it, forget it. This, uh, I'm talking about the wrong study. There's another study. (laughs) I'm losing my mind. There's another study where they have the caregiver make a blank face toward the baby and that blank face with no reaction. The baby tries to get all these different reactions from um, laughing or clapping or crying. And whenever the baby became distressed, they were like, stop doing that. Um, Like just make facial expressions back. Oh my God. See, I can't just like let this go. I need to see who did the study. One second. Okay, so in 1975, Edward Tronick and colleagues first presented the, quote, still face experiment, end quote, to colleagues at the biennial meeting of the Society for Research and Child Development. I will include that as well. But all of this backstory that wasn't even in fucking important. (laughs) This is the bane of my existence of like, they need context. They need context. Here I am giving context. It's not even the right one. Welcome to the inside. Just a little toe dip into the inside of my brain. I'm so sorry. It's so disorganized in here. Um, It makes sense to me. It's an organized mess to me. But the way that this relates to the, the still face experiment relates to the uncanny valley is that they found that when there's no facial expression, not anger, not happiness, not sadness that's made at the baby from their caregiver, they have an extreme visceral and distressed response to that blank face. And I, even though this wasn't brought up in any of the articles about the Uncanny Valley, um, I saw stuff related to like Freud's unconscious theory and all that shit. And I was just like, fuck that. I'm going to tell you actual studies (laughs) that were done so that you can see why there might be, like, I'm not saying Freud's wrong. Like maybe he's right about some things. Um, I just mean to say that like there are studies that show the visceral reaction that are a bit more recent than like the 1800s. You know, I feel like the more recent studies are ones we should go with. But who am I to say? Just, you know, a trauma and child therapist that uses evidence based practices, but whatever. But now moving on to another psychological phenomena as to why this might be happening is cognitive dissonance. So 
Cognitive dissonance describes like a discomfort from conflicting mental states. So like a neutral example of this would be like, let's say someone like I had a friend who hated sushi or said she hated sushi. And I was like, okay, but like, have you ever tried it? She's like, no. And I understand not wanting to try certain things. Like I will not eat fruit. It's gross. But like she liked fish. And so like, I don't understand, like this was totally up her alley. So I'm like, why don't you try it? She's like, well, it sounds gross. So I had her try sushi and she had a bit of cognitive dissonance because she clearly liked it. She clearly liked it. And then at the same time, she was like, oh man, but for years I've said I hate it. And so she had to wrestle with that. It was horrible to watch. And she almost like, (laughs) she almost like said in defeat, like it's good. Like she is like upset with herself. So that's an example of cognitive dissonance that has nothing to do with this like fear moment. But how it relates to the uncanny valley is that you get a visual and behavioral cues that are incongruent. So like our brain is struggling to see that it's like, oh, your brain says that that's a human or a living thing. However, it doesn't feel like a living thing. And this humanoid appearance raises the expectation of human-like behavior, but these subtle deviations or major deviations create a very jarring mismatch that triggers that unease. Another one that's really interesting to me that I like really honed in on was the evolutionary psychology behind it. So Psychologists propose that the fear associated with the uncanny valley has roots in our in our ancestral environments. And you know how much I love talking about ancestor shit. Um, so throughout human evolution, our ability to quickly identify and react to potential threat potential threats has been really important for survival. That's why, like, I don't know if you've ever run past a stick that you think is a snake, and I like snakes. Um, I would have a pet snake if my husband wasn't petrified of them. But like, I've run past a stick that I thought was a snake and I'm like, ah, and I jump and then I'm like, oh, it's a stick. Like, that's a really good, like, it's not the thing that it said it was, but I needed to react accordingly. So an entity that appears human yet is a not human will signal danger and pr- promote that like hypervigilance and fear as a human response. So I thought that was interesting. Something else I want to throw in there is the role of like empathy, projection and recognition. So empathy is a very human reaction. It's our emotional response to human-like entities. And when an object becomes more human-like, we project our own emotional and cognitive states onto it a lot of the time. But if this projection is met with that like uncanny valley that like, oh, it's not quite human, it kind of disrupts our ability to recognize and empathize with it. Um, And that might even lead to an aversive reaction. And something that I thought was very interesting is that young, young babies are able to recognize human like faces. Like if you draw Um, They did this study of, I'm not, I promise I won't go on another study caveat. I'm not even going to look this one up. You're just going to have to trust my word on this one. They did a study where they put like these basic shapes in like an eye and eye and a mouth form and the baby would look at it and try and talk to it or make facial expressions at like a piece of paper with that on there. So humans are made to recognize faces. What I also think is interesting, and I'll include this in the show notes below, is that it used to be said that people who can recognize faces and things um, were like more likely to have like a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. But I remember hearing about that like a long time whenever I was a little, little kid. And I was like, well, I guess I'm destined to have a psychotic disorder because I see like faces and everything. And then it turns out that they did more studies on it and people, humans just see faces and everything in general. Like there might be some folks who are like very creative or whatever, and they can see faces a little more often or they try more often to, but it has no correlation or causation at all with psychotic disorders. Um, So I just thought that was really weird that people, it's like a normal human thing and they're like, oh, but this could be a worrisome thing. And I, I think that kind of, this is me speculating, but I think that that whole like, oh, this might mean something like a diagnosis of some sort that's heavily stigmatized because, you know, 
no one understands schizophrenia either and it's heavily stigmatized and a lot of the stuff you see on tv isn't real but I know I'm preaching to the choir right now and you already know this but I'm just throwing that out there (laughs) um but uh it's interesting because I feel like people who see faces that aren't really there probably experience more like like if we hear about that, we would empathize with them like us humans do. And we would be like, oh, that's really creepy, scary, whatever. And then we kind of project that they're going to have uncanny valley experiences more often than the average person and maybe even see things that aren't there. So that's just me speculating, but I think it's kind of interesting to think about. There are also cultural and societal factors that contribute to uncanny valley effect. And there are like these eerie lifelike entities and folklore and literature and media that kind of lift up this collective unease and the portrayal of humanoid figures as monsters or entities in horror genres reinforce that association between human-like and the uncanny. But I thought that was really interesting to think about all the ways that our brain wants to categorize everything and wants it to be either human or not human and anything in that in between makes us really, really uncomfortable or even like viscerally react in a negative way. I love that I got to talk about this with you. And I love that Alexandra was like, hey, you should uh, talk about this because there was way more there than I originally thought. Um, Thanks for listening to me go on minor deep dives about this kind of stuff. And I appreciate you listening so much. And I will talk to you next week. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email Core and Folklore at gmail.com. If you like this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible, and the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland, and I'll see you next time.